At this time, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Shepard. Uh, Dr. Shepard, the way I introduced you um, in making the announcements is that you're my doctor. Um, if doctors try to treat themselves, they have a fool for a patient and a fool for a doctor. And so I, I go to the doctor myself and Dr. Shepard is the one I'm frequently going to, except when he's out of town, which happens somewhat frequently. Um, and um, Dr. Shepard was trained at Loma Linda University, same uh, as my alma mater as well. And then he practiced, uh, he went to, if I recall correctly, the Hinsdale Family Practice Residency and then practiced in California with a emphasis in lifestyle medicine, doing many different uh, lifestyle medicine programs for his community. But he's been with us here in Chattanooga for the last 10 years, practicing as a faculty with University of Tennessee, training the next generation of family practice physicians. Um, and works there at the uh, main uh, campus of University of Tennessee uh, Family Practice, right there at that large building on the corner of uh, Central and Third Avenue. So Dr. Shepard, we are thankful that you are here with us this evening. And um, I think we've made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen at the bottom, the green button down at the bottom. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have for us this evening. Looks like I got too many. Got too many. Oh, too many screens open. Yeah, you got to find the right one to share there, huh? Yep. Can you see that? Nope. We'll tell you when it comes up here. There it is. Okay. Yeah. What I was talking about tonight is uh, diabetes mellitus and how it really is a um, lifestyle disease. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about just the, the diagnosis and a few other things, but try to keep it very light and do, just to get the ideas. But I'm also going to invite, introduce you to a group of people called the Pima Indians and how that's been studied for a long time and, and, and how much problems that the American diet has created in their lives. So diabetes is mainly type one and type two. Type one is often referred to as juvenile diabetes because it's the kind of diabetes that one would normally happen to a six-year-old, seven-year-old. When they come in the hospital, almost comatose. Um, and if they don't get insulin immediately, they'll probably die before the end of that hospitalization. And, and I'll come back to that later as a history point as to why that's so important. But most people get type two diabetes mellitus and that's about 95% of the population. And that person has plenty of insulin. In fact, if measured at any one time, they'll probably have more insulin than the normal person has. Uh, if you're diagnosed with uh, diabetes, uh, the way we used to do it with fasting blood sugars, anything over 126 would be considered diabetes or a random blood sugar, anything over 200. Sometimes we would do a two or three hour glucose tolerance test to find out. Nowadays, we often can go through what's called an A1C or a hemoglobin A1C, and anything over about 6.5 on that is a diabetes. Hey, Dr. Shepard, let me pause you just for a moment. What we're seeing on our screens is your email with an attachment that says diabetes mellitus. Um, yeah, your, your mouse was just there, um, but we're not actually seeing any, any slides except for the first one. Um, we're not seeing the actual PowerPoint slides. I think you have to open the PowerPoint first, or if you've done that, it was just the wrong window. Mm -hmm. I thought I had it there for a second. Are you still with me? Yeah, we're still with you. We just don't see this your screen anymore. It uh, quit sharing. So if you wiggle your button on the screen and go down to the share screen at the bottom and click that, it'll give you an option of all your screens and you just have to pick the one that has the PowerPoint mm -hmm. slides uh, themselves open. I'm gonna have to go back and get it. Yeah, sorry. Just didn't want to go through the whole presentation without you knowing that. Uh -huh. Okay, now.
Can you see that one? So what we see now is you're in, yeah, there we go. So you're, you're kind of flipping through the scroll. Yeah. Okay. That one? Yeah, that'll work. You're, you haven't opened it. It's within your, um, it's within your um, email. email, which is fine if that's the way you'd like to show it. Not necessarily. My suggestion is double click on where your mouse is right now and it should open that file in your PowerPoint program. But it's not. Oh, it's not. You may, do you have PowerPoint on that computer? I, I supposed to go to the drop down menu. Wait a minute. On Wait a minute. Thinking about it. How about that? Um, well, you, we're still looking at the same thing, but if it opened, you can stop sharing and start sharing the other screen that just opened if it did open your PowerPoint program. So just click the stop share up at the top of the screen. Um, um, no, it's it's within the Zoom program. Yeah, I'm trying to find it. Here we go. Mm. There we go. Quit sharing. So then start sharing again and find that PowerPoint uh, program that just opened. Can you see that now? Yeah, that's looking much better. So now my uh, you can flip through it like that, or if you want to make it full screen, down near the bottom, that um, tiny to, to the right, just a little bit, right, right, yeah, right there. It'll make it full screen if you want. If you don't have any notes, that's probably the best bet. Huh? There. <laughs> I got it now. Yeah, we're look we're looking at your presenter view, but. Um, oh yeah, I can see it. I don't know why that went. I don't went. know how to fix it out of uh, presenter view uh, when it. Uh, shows us his screen in presenter view. Usually it just shows us the, um, the actual slide. My suggestion is to, um, to stop sharing and go back and share again, choose advanced, and then select the area around the, on the left-hand side here. And that will just be all that's displayed. Okay, that, that may be a little difficult here, but uh, we could do that. So do you want to talk him through that there? Yeah, I think I'll probably do that because I'm not sure I'll ever get back. Okay. So, go ahead, Chris. All right. So if you just click stop sharing. Bottom or the top. I got it. It says, oh, there it is. Stop share. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now um, you're going to click uh, share screen at the bottom in the green. And uh, you go up to the top where it says advanced. Okay. You see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you click advanced and it says portion of screen. Yep. You'll select portion of screen and you'll click share. And then it will give you uh, the option to highlight an area that you are going to be sharing. It's a green area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So you need to move it. So it's just over the area on the left hand side. Okay, if you can expand it a little bit by pulling one corner or something so we can see the whole screen or shrinking the inside down, one of the two. Yeah. Looks like we're almost there. It's moving, but not enlarging. You have to grab the corners of it to uh, make it bigger or smaller. Yeah, so you'll touch the corner and then left click and then pull it. There we go. That's it. Very nice. Are you seeing anything else now? No, that's all we see is just that section there. DM2. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking back about up. the uh, A1C. Yeah. What I tell my patients about A1C is better understanding that is it is telling us what the average blood sugar has been over the last four months. Before this happened, patients would uh, notoriously not do anything about taking their insulin or, or, or medications until they got about three days before they see me because they want me to feel good about them. They would then suddenly take their insulin for about three or four days. So the blood sugar was a little lower and I couldn't tell the difference. 
I knew intuitively they weren't doing anything about it because nothing else was right. But now all I have to do is check a one A1C and I can tell that they only been taking their insulin for the last three or four days because I can tell what the average blood sugar is. Way to think about this is realize that a red blood cell is born in the, in the bone marrow and then goes swimming through our blood vessels for about four months until it reaches its end of its life and it is disintegrated. And during those four, this guy, I have it on here months, excuse me, four, yeah, four months, um, it's swimming in the sugar, in the blood vessels. And the longer it swims in there, it gets co candy coated by the sugar around it. So what we're actually measuring is the average candy coating of the red cells. And we can tell what the average blood sugar has been over the last four months. Um, <clears throat> The risk factors for diabetes is probably number one is our family history. If you have a family who has a lot of diabetics, you probably have a high risk of that. But I tell my patients, you don't have diabetes because your parents did. You don't inherit diabetes. You inherit a switch. What I mean is that you, you have a switch and if you do the things that it takes to turn the switch on, you'll get diabetes. And what those things are is gaining weight and eating high fat and sugar foods. You can turn the switch off, but the good news is if it's a switch, you can also turn it off by changing that. Another problem is the longer we live, of course, the, long, the heavier we tend to get. And so the lifespan increases the number of diabetics. As you can see right now, it's about 78 years for the average man and about 80 years old for the 80, average female. Give you some idea of the change of this back in, President Roosevelt's time and then right after the war, uh, when they made Social Security, they expected only about four out of 100 to ever uh, receive Social Security. Of course, now you can tell how bad it is. It's less than one out of two. The other is a change of our lifestyle. We used to be very um, agriculture related. We plowed fields, we farmed, we took care of the cattle, we we'd bring in all the work we had to do all day long. And now what we do is pretty much sit like we're doing right now on a, on a sofa in front of a, or on a chair in front of a computer. We do much less work. The average person's amount of so exercise they get is going from the front door to the car door, and then from the car door to work. Very little activity, while at the same time we've increased our food intake, not only in portions, but in uh, the less um, nutritious, high dense foods that we have eaten. We call that the SAD diet or the standard American diet. Um, it all, diabetes also correlates to visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat that's actually just below the, um, the muscles of our belly. It's not what you can jiggle on the outside, but it's on the inside that surrounds all of our intestines, surrounds the liver, the kidneys, and it becomes uh, very hazardous to our bodies. And this correlates worldwide, unfortunately, with a lower socioeconomic class, primarily because of the lifestyle and the, the diet that they tend to eat. And just to make sure that we all get a little dis depressed, let me see if, uh, realize that nine out of 10 of the, of the most obese states in the United States is right here in the South. And it probably comes from so much soda, sweet tea that's drunk here in the United, in the South. And if, I've noticed that since I've been here that the Southerners will fry absolutely anything that doesn't move. And I'm sure a few things that do. And also the percentage of the meals eaten now, about three meals a day for a high percentage of my patients. They sit in line at uh, Chick-fil-A. They stop on the way home and get uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or pizza. I'm at two to three meals a day eaten out of the high fat, high sugar content foods. In 2003, a study came out estimating that of those born after 2000, one out of three will become diabetics. <clears throat> the symptoms of diabetes, when a person comes into my office and I ultimately gonna diagnose them with diabetes, is they're usually very thirsty, they're peeing all the time. They're actually quite hungry, yet they're losing weight. A lot of people can't figure it out. Even my residents don't quite understand how in the world can I be eating so much money, so much food and lose weight? Well, it's because you're taking in all those calories, but they're staying in the bloodstream and being peed out the urine and not going to your cells where they need the help. And this is created by insulin resistance. 
we're going to come to it. I don't know if you can see a little screen. Can you see that when it talks about insulin resistance up here or not? Probably yeah. not. Insulin resistance to our muscles, our fat cells, our liver cells, what it is is the fat actually decreases the circulating cholesterol and increases triglycerides in our system, hardening of arteries. In the liver, it reduces the ability to store glycogen. Now, glycogen is like, if you go into the liver, there's all kinds of shelves in the liver where bags or boxes of stored glucose called glycogen are. For those times when you get cold and you have to go and perform, but you haven't had anything to eat for a long time, that's so that you won't collapse on the way. Unfortunately, with insulin resistance, that gets disrupted and it starts leaking out and promoting all the glucose, glucose that's being stored in glycogen stores all through the night and all through the day. That's why diabetics wake up in the morning, their blood sugars are 250 and they can't figure out why, because I haven't eaten all night. So how could it be so high? Well, it's that glycogen stores in those, uh, from the liver that's coming in all night. This is what I was talking about. I want you to imagine insulin resistance. I want you to imagine right now in the start of football season, <clears throat> that line is the scrimmage line of football. Okay. We have the offensive lineman lined up here, and we have the defensive lineman over here, and we have insulin, and his job is to take the glucose and run through the line. On this side of the line, is the bloodstream on that side of the scrimmage line is our cells. And that can be a fat cell, a liver cell, a brain cell, muscle cell, it, it all go, need glucose to work on. Well, what happens, imagine these cells, the defensive linemen getting bigger and bigger and bigger until now when he runs, he hits and he can't, he fouls and insulin just falls off and never can get out of the bloodstream into the cells. You can imagine when that's happening, the blood sugar will keep going up, while at the same time, the cells are starving for their glucose, and that's insulin resistance. That's when you see a patient taking 120, 130 units of insulin. You ever wonder what it takes for you as a normal, healthy individual to keep your blood sugars normal? How much insulin that takes? Probably 18 to 20 units a day. And so when you have patients taking 120 units a day, that's definite insulin resistance. One of the markers of that visceral fat that creates that insulin resistance is our abdominal circumference. In men who have greater than 38 inches waistline, they have a very high risk of that. Women, if they're more than 34, their risk is very high. What we're starting to see, unfortunately now, is obesity in children to the point where we're seeing high blood sugars, they're type two diabetics, and elevated cholesterols, even in kids at 14 and 15. We just had a child come through the office the other day, he was 15 years old, weighed 350 pounds. His cholesterols were high and his blood sugars were very high. We're already having to treat him. <clears throat> Excuse me, since 2000, the number of adults diagnosed with diabetes has doubled and by 19, uh, 2030, we'll expect it to double again. Therefore, in just 20 years or in four, 30 years, been a four times increase in diabetes, all because of that standard American diet killing us, causing diabetes to be the, third, uh, the fifth uh, major cause of death in the United States. Um, what diabetes ca causes isn't just blood sugar elevation. It actually, I tell my patients to think of it as hardening of the arteries. It's an accelerated hardening of the arteries disease. Think about it. What does a person in, as a diabetic die from? Number one, heart disease. Ah, same as everybody else, but about 10 to 15 years earlier. The same thing as a, a stroke, about 10 to 15 years earlier. Kidney failure. Hardening of the arteries causes kidney failure, and 80% of people in dialysis are diabetics. Then you hear about them having loss of blood supply of their feet, and they lose feet uh, because of amputation, because of sores and ulcers that won't heal, or they feel like they're walking on broken glass. The problem with diabetes now, with all this added in, it's almost a $400 plus billion dollar industry every single year, all because of lifestyle. Now, I introduced you originally to uh, some people called the Pima Indians. Uh, 
If you've not heard of them, Pima Indians originated in Arizona. They had a traditional lifestyle of farming. They actually adapted to farming by forming elaborate irrigation systems to bring in water so they could deal with it. They, they lived a subsistence farming agriculture lifestyle. It's pretty hard work. They had long life and their primary intake was things like corn, beans, squash, and they grew cotton for their, for their clothing and so on. They had a very low fat, high complex carbohydrate diet and a lot of manual labor. Well, guess what happened? Along with all the other Indians in the United States, uh, we put them on Indian reservation. Then because we really felt sorry for them because we just put them on Indian reservation, we gotta make sure we feed them well. So as well intended, we shipped in by carloads from the railroad, beef and pork and chicken and turkey, fish and, uh, and cheese. And their diet changed to greater than 40% of their diet as fat. And guess what happened to their labor? Now they don't have to work. They're given money. And so they mostly as a sedentary lifestyle again. Here's what happened. <clears throat> in 1900, there was only about one case of diabetes on the, on the reservation. By 1937, there's 21 cases. By 1950, there were 10 times that amount, over 200. By 1970, 40% of the Pima Indians had type 2 diabetes. And right now, it's over 50%. What changed? That diet went from a uh, low fat, high complex diet to a very high fat, sugar based diet and a decreased workload. Interestingly enough, when the Americans put them on a reservation, there was a small group, a band that actually managed to get away from the United States Army and went south into the mountains of Baja, California, in the Sierra Madre Mountains. And until 1991, there were absolutely no roads. They were totally isolated. They were noted in the 1970s and 80s by people going in that area and found them, their lifestyle exactly the same as always. Very agricultural, subsistent living, working hard in growing things, uh, plowing the fields and so on. And what they found is that their BMI was much lower. They were lighter individuals. Their cholesterol was lower. And they had only about 5% diabetes compared to 50% uh, in their counterparts in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> and it all changed from the diet. Now, one of the problems we're dealing with is that uh, in the United States, we consume enormous amounts of sugar. And the um, a ADA estimates that one serving of, uh, of Coke, 12 ounces a day will increase the risk of diabetes by over 13%. But you switch to water, we can decrease that by at least seven to 8%. And this was something hard to understand. In the 19, or 1800s, say about the time of Civil War, the average person ate about six pounds of sugar per year. Now, what do you think it is? 200 pounds of sugar per year. Enormous amounts of difference. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that you can prevent it. I'm not going to do and say anything about these. I'm just going to show you there have been multiple studies actually preventing diabetes from them. What I am going to tell you by changing the diet, specifically eliminating the sugars and the fats, but also increasing the fiber is extremely important. That's because the th when we're eating refined processed food, it takes almost all the fiber out of it. If you think about a kernel of wheat, it's surrounded by the fibrous kernel uh, and inside is the little wheat germ where all the protein and the nutritional source is. That secondary piece in the middle where the meat of it is, is, is um, what is usually turned into flour and it has very high calorie count for a very low nutrition. And then what they do is they take the wheat germ and sell it off as wheat germ and they take the husk and sell it off as fiber and make more money while Americans are eating white bread. If you need more fiber, you can see some of the sources of it, beans and lentils, uh, peas, broccoli, berries, uh, raspberries, blueberries, whole grains. One of the things I want you to notice is that you haven't seen anything here labeled meat. Because whether you take beef, pork, fish, there's absolutely zero fiber. Cheese, absolutely zero fiber. And we'd like to have the goal uh, when we're talking about eating fats in our diet, 
the ADA diet recommends 30%. I think we should be more closer to 10 to 20, or maybe more like 15%. Uh, we can get the fats that we need from polyunsaturated fats like olive oils, nuts, seeds, avocados, and icosapentoic acid in the flaxseed oil. Some people get it from fish oil. What the uh, omega-3 acids do is they decrease the triglycerides in our diets because triglycerides tend to go up with all diabetics and decreases the endothelial inflammation. The earliest part of hardening of the arteries, the endothelial um, inflammation. Much of our problem comes to the fact that the food industry now, we buy it to store rather than make it ourselves or grow it ourselves. And what we have is huge amounts of processed foods. I like to talk about it as what they inject or put stuff into our food. It's not food, it's stuff put into that food. You'll find it is flavoring, uh, colors, added sugars, and every name you can imagine for sugar, dextrose, uh, high fructose corn syrup, sucrose, um, and everything you can imagine. They sometimes separated in several of them so that they doesn't show like very high on in the individual lists. Also chemical preservatives. You pick up something that you can't pronounce the names, you probably shouldn't be eating it. Also very high in salt. Some of the stuff that we're seeing that when I'm, that's what I'm talking about here is our soft drinks, ice cream, sweetened sugars, uh, sweetened cereals, uh, chips, packaged soups, and so on. Um, people often ignore the fact that their chips that they eat every day are very um, high in the, um, car the complex, not complex, but the refined carbohydrates and a lot of salt. Part of the reason we're having problems we don't even think about, and that's just the, the serving sizes. You can see this, uh, if you can still see my screen, just from 2000 to 2020, a French fries went from two and a half per, um, grams to uh, it's almost seven grams. And a soda pop, average serving was 12 ounces, now it's 20 or 30, up to 350 calories in a single serving. And, and a bagel went from three inches to six inches. A pepperoni slice of pizza used to be uh, 610 calories, it's now so much bigger that it's over 850 calories. <clears throat> Welcome to Starbucks. Everybody needed to pay a lot more money for coffee, so Starbucks made a lot of money. And in making it, they want people to have something they want to come back for, so they started selling coffee, but coffee only gets you about 10, cups, uh, 10 calories per cup. It's what you put into the coffee. When you talk about uh, getting a Frappuccino Grande, depending on what you put in it, it can be 110 to, six, to 460 calories, or a coffee creams, 160 to 400 calories. And I know people that drink that two or three times a day, and that's not including any soda pop or iced tea that they drink. Uh, <clears throat> back in 2006, PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, did a study where they compared the vegan diet to the actual official American Diabetic Association diet. And you can see in absolutely every category, the vegan diet outperformed it, the American diabetic diet. It dropped the hemoglobin A1C about 1.2% and the diet, the ADA diet only 0.4. There was about a 16 pound weight loss, only about six in the ADA diet. LDL, the bad cholesterol went down 21%, but only 10% in the ADA diet. And as you can see, in every category, it changed and improved uh, on, on the American Diabetic Association diet. But I've noticed something. There has been absolutely no change in the American Diabetic Association recommendations. Uh, they just don't seem to want to make any changes in, in it. Another thing we recommend is increasing the activity level. Remember I told you that the, um, the problem is uh, changing from a uh, agricultural di uh, a lifestyle where we used to have to plow the fields and grow our food and, and take care of the livestock to now we sit and turn the channels or get on our computer and walk from the front door to the, to the, the car door. The minimum recommendation is at least 30 minutes of exercise. That's moderate exercise, like heavy, fast walking five times a week. I would recommend we double that. Just a quick little history to make this interesting. In, 2000, in 1922, 
I had one of my residents actually ask if it was during my residency that it came out. Um, two doctors came out and discovered that you could take the beef and the pork that was being slaughtered and, and turn it into beef and, 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 the, and the meats that we eat and take their pancreas. They could grind it down and, cre and create insulin that we could use to keep somebody alive. Now, remember I told you that in, in type one diabetics, they need, absolutely need insulin. There is no, no insulin in their bodies. Before 1922, a kid coming into the emergency room, almost comatose, smelling like fruit, blood sugars at 600, would probably not survive that week, that the hospital stay. If he did, he probably would not survive the next one. That all changed in 1922 when we discovered insulin. However, in 1982, uh, uh, Eli Lilly was able to figure out how to make human or synthetic human um, insulin, believe it or not, training E. coli bacteria to make it. I'm not sure how you train them to do that, but they, that's how they created it. The reason that's so important is because beef and pork are not exactly human insulins, and therefore we developed, uh, re not resistance, but a alert, a, uh, immune reaction to them. And so we, it no longer would work for us. <clears throat> in the 1960s, uh, we all we had was a medicine that was medicines to help us with blood sugars was basically something that was whipping the pancreas to make a little bit more. You got to make a little bit more. You got to make a little bit more until the pancreas couldn't work. Then along in the 1960s and 70s came metformin and it's still the number one medicine we use. It works in multiple areas in our body. But um, <clears throat> one of the other history things that's really interesting is in the 1950s and 70s, if I wanted to test your blood sugar, what I, I, I could run a blood test on you, but that wouldn't tell me anything until tomorrow. It would not help me with trying to figure out what insulin to give you. What we used to do was actually have you pee in a cup and the test strips dipped into the pee and changed colors. And depending on what color it changed, I could give you an estimate of what the sugar was in the pee. Now, if you're thinking, you realize that it takes several hours from the time it leaves the bloodstream, goes through the kidney, gets into the bladder, and I dip it. So every time we are making changes based on blood sugars that were over four, years, four hours old. So you can imagine what the roller coaster ride was. <clears throat> then in the 1980s, and this is when I really was in my residency, the first blood sugar monitor came out. And what a great uh, improvement that was. And then now we have continuous monitoring. We have at least two different brands that uh, we put a little monitor on your arm or on your tummy and take your cell phone. We can just cover over it and tell us what our blood sugar is in a matter of minutes. But the most important thing is, that, is to realize that all this is talking about insulin and we have all kinds of medicines, including shots and pills that modify that. But the sad thing is it's a modifiable disease because it is almost entirely created by our diet and our activity and our weight levels. If we, when, when people come in to see me, I, I tell them, sometimes tell them, you, you don't have diabetes because you're deficient in metformin. You've got diabetes because of the fat in your diet and the fat on your body and your visceral fat. If we can modify that, your insulin resistance will come down and it won't require any more insulin to take care of you than it does me. Once they start realizing that, then just finding more medicines isn't the important thing. The important thing is changing the cause, not just changing the numbers. And that's basically what I had for you today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shepard. Um, I just found that uh, especially the illustration of the football players on offense and defense trying to run the uh, sugar molecule as the football. Uh, I thought that was a really good uh, explanation that I'm going to yeah. use. Instead of being um, an effective running back, he bounces off now. Yeah. He can't keep uh, the blood sugar down. So, and, and the cells are starving. Yeah. That's, that's a really, really good um, analogy that I think is going to be helpful in our health programs, because I think a lot of people can relate to that. Um, I've heard a lot of other analogies like the key in the lock and stuff like that. Oh, there we go. Look at that. 
Uh, you've been drawing. So uh, what's the play call? Um, I mean, I guess you see yourself then as kind of a play caller. You're the coach who is uh, trying to figure out how to um, get past the defensive line. Yeah. Or how to what I find with patience, is, and you probably do as well, is illustrations that they can understand helps. Once they can get a grasp and understanding, they can make changes. Before that, it's it's just confusing for them. Yeah, that's what's most important about medicine as well, and especially for these lifestyle diseases, is helping patients um, learn how to um, find the motivation, the um, inspiration, and the ability and the uh, uh, information they need to make changes. Well, what, uh, anyone have any questions for Dr. Shepard? While you're thinking about questions, I'll briefly give a promo for next month's dinner with the doctor. Um, I really appreciate Dr. Shepard and his emphasis on lifestyle medicine. There's a few doctors in town that have that emphasis. Dr. Shepard is one of them. Uh, another one that we've had one lecture from before is Dr. Sumit Bhushan. He is a gastroenterologist uh, that I work with fairly frequently. And... Um, he uh, has been eating plant-based for quite some time. And um, last, I think it was about a year and a half ago or so, he gave a lecture about some gastrointestinal uh, complaints. Um, it was only about a year ago, I don't know. But anyway, he's gonna come back and give us another uh, lecture about the lifestyle treatment and the lifestyle causes related to some specific GI complaints that uh, he is frequently uh, treating. But at this time, uh, what questions do we have for Dr. Shepard about uh, his lecture, diabetes, or any other? Uh, Dr. Shepard knows a little bit about everything because that's the definition of a family practice doctor. So if you have a question about anything, he can at least get you started on a really good answer. So any questions for Dr. Shepard? I'd invite you at least to Google the Pima Indians. It's really an interesting story. Google Pima Indians. Yes, Emily, go ahead. Hi. Hi. I um, work in dermatology and I sometimes see a subset of patients, I want to say around 10, female. Sorry, I have a. Whoops, you just went quiet on us. You just muted yourself, Emily. Check, check your, your mic. Okay, sorry. Um, so I have a subset of patients and they have some skin changes like acanthosis, nigricam um, issues. I send them over to gynecology um, and they are some overweight. Um, they also, <clears throat> what else do they have? Sometimes acne, some, some, some like grade one acne. And um, so I send them over to, and like uh, to, it depends on their, their gynecological history sometimes. Sometimes I'll send them over to the gynecologist to rule out PCOS. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes um, I'll, I'll get some input from endocrine, but the bottom line is sometimes I don't find anything, but they, they still have these, what seem to be like an insulin resistant like change. So is there a spectrum or is there like a prelim on some sort of an insulin resistance in some of these younger patients that are overweight and having these changes? Emily, before, and Dr. Shepard, before you answer that, let me interpret for our listeners here just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Emily is a really smart person who knows all about dermatology. Acanthosis nigricans is frequently um, some darkening of the skin, thickening of the skin, usually right around the neck areas. And PCOS is polycystic ovary syndrome, but probably most of you uh, knew that. So I knew Phil knew what acanthosis nigricans was. And it is associated, as she's suggesting, with um, insulin resistance and some of these other um, uh, metabolic syndromes here. So, Dr. Shepard, uh, is there a spectrum here? Well, I, I think there certainly is a broad spectrum in it. Uh, one of the things we're finding is, again, kids are getting all these insulin resistance problems due to their body fat and weight and their diet much earlier than they were before. We used to rarely see diabetics until their mid-30s or, or into the 40s. We're starting to see it in the kids. I, I have seen acanthosis anigricans in 14 and 15 year olds already. It, it's a real problem. However, one of the things I tell my patients again is, um, didn't your mom ever tell you that life ain't fair? You know, you can find somebody who is just a 30, 40 pounds overweight, start to develop all the symptoms, even PCOS or uh, 
acanthosis nigricans, and starting to get insulin resistance when the person who doesn't have the genetic predisposition can be 150 pounds overweight and not develop any of it. But if you're predisposed to it, sometimes a very small amount can make a big difference. And I still think the best way to go is start working on the insulin resistance, changing even to 10 or 15 pounds and change the diet. And it really does make a difference. Good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Also, um, uh, I'm, I'm not a major pusher of the medications, but I would suggest that, that metformin helps a lot with that because it actually has a tendency to lose weight with it. Good. Patrice, did you have a question? I do have a question. Um, have you ever have you ever noticed if metformin uh, is a, maybe a side effect? If uh, well, I've I've been taking metformin for a year and a half now, and they put me on it when my A one C was seven point one, mm -hmm. and now I'm having trouble with uh, my potassium being too high. I just found that out today, and my B12 being too low. Well, I, I can't say I've actually seen that listed as side effects, but the number one side effect with metformin by far and away is all GI related, gastrointestinal, most commonly diarrhea, and anything that's going to change your bowels uh, and function of your bowels will change your absorption of things like vitamin B12 and uh, can change your, your uh, chemi chemistries like potassium. No question about that. Okay. What the I would other thing, tend to say would be to stop ahead. the medication and recheck in two or three months. Stop the metformin? Mm -hmm. If it's creating more problems than it's fixing, it's not worth keeping. Well, I'm also taking Losartan potassium. Well, now Losartan is well known to actually hold on to potassium and raise potassium levels. Okay, well, my doctor today and the pharmacist said no, that it would not do that. Yeah, it, it, potassium actually is, it raises potassium regularly. And in mm -hmm. fact, should be checked with chemistries at least twice a year to pro prove that it's not doing it. All right, so it might be the Losartan potassium that's increasing the mm -hmm. potassium level. Yeah, it's actually it? well known to do that. Okay, so where do I go from here? Do I try? Do I go to my endocrinologist? Because uh, this is my family practitioner says no. Um, if, if he's saying no, I either find somebody else or go to the endocrinologist first. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. in fact, um, I, we have a computerized system here, and computers can remember things better than we can. Every right. time I re refill a prescription for something like Losartan or its other kind of one we hear about, like Cinepril, it actually flashes on the screen. Has this person been tested with chemistry uh, in the last six months? Because yeah, I'm, I'm tested every six months. Yeah. This is the first time. It just I'm... wants to know because it has a notorious effect of raising potassium. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll call the Most people it doesn't, time. but it sure can. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm getting real. I've been real jittery and anxious for the past two weeks. To the point of exercise, I'm just exhausted mm -hmm. uh, from the jittery, and so and I guess I better call him tomorrow. I think I would. Mm -hmm. I'll call Dr. Huffman and see. Yeah. Good. Thank Any you. other questions? Um... So um, I'm blanking on the name of the tests, Dr. Shepard, but um, um, there's, I think there was some test called a HOMA IR or a, um, uh, there's something else. There's some way you can test for insulin resistance before the blood sugars actually start to change. Um, is that routinely done? No, no. Okay. It, I, I think ever since uh, A1C came out, it's just kind of lost favor because it's harder to do. Uh, it, it, what it is, is actually checking for uh, passing blood sugar and, 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 and insulin levels at the same time and making a ratio. Okay. So yeah, that would be more difficult to do and also probably less accurate than the A1C test. Yeah. Uh, but it sure be interesting to know in those patients that uh, uh, Emily was referring to who 
uh, have the acanthosis nigra cans, but their blood sugar levels are not yet elevated. And, are and those you can patients... you can order just a uh, serum insulin levels, and you'll find that already those people are running on the high levels, certainly more than than you'd expect. Sir so pancreas is already having to is already having to work harder to make up for the insulin resistance. Got it. Well, I see just looking on the screen here that at least one person sitting in front of a screen is getting some exercise. So, uh, hey, uh, Dad, you want to advertise what it is you're doing right there to keep from uh, being sedentary? Well, Dr. Shepard is uh, my physician, too. And uh, so he discovered I had some osteoporosis. So I am wearing a vest and I also am doing lifting weights. And then instead of having my legs get DVTs when I'm sitting here, I'm pedaling a uh, pedaling device under my desk, uh, desktop. There you go. So uh, Dr. Shepard should be happy. <laughs> so he's going to recheck my DEXA in December because I'll yeah. to have worn that vest for a year. And uh, if it works, fine. If it doesn't, I don't want to wear it anymore. <laughs> it's, it's always gratifying to have somebody follow advice because only about one out of 20 really do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Phil has definitely been, uh, I, I thought what Phil was doing was getting ready for our next church backpacking trip because he's wearing a 20 pound vest around all over the place. And I mean, that's more preparation for a backpacking trip than I ever did. Yep. So he's, he's ready to go. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Chris? Should we take him? Sorry, I was distracted momentarily. Say that again. Oh, I was just uh, pointing out that Phil's been wearing this 20 pound vest everywhere he goes. He's like ready for uh, our church backpacking oh, trip. Oh, yes, yes, ready for a backpacking trip. Oh. In fact, in fact, I want to invite you all to a wonderful backpacking trip we're going to have later this fall. If you want some good exercise out of nature, do what Dr. Steinke calls forest bathing then i mean fully clothed you're just out in the woods experiencing the nature we'll we'll, ha we'll have a backpacking trip later this year loved it love to have you <laughs> all right well dad just keep in mind we're getting ready for that um so um i know you love camping and love the outdoors so uh i will say that the four inch thick um uh big agnes um uh air mattresses have transformed the uh, camping experience for me. It's <laughs> yeah. just as comfortable as my uh, bed here at home. So even though I'm out in a sleeping bag, quote unquote, roughing it, it's, uh, it's still very comfortable. So, um, and we might even have some car camping opportunities for those of you who really wanna bring the three foot thick air mattress. So anyhow, well, I'm sure we'll send out some announcements about that, that at some point. Any final questions for Dr. Shepard before we close here? All right. Well, thanks to, um, I, I think uh, several of you have had an opportunity to contribute to our South Bay Health Center that is still in progress. Thank you to those of you who have done that. You can always go to southbaysda.org and click on the health link to find all the uh, latest health programs that are going to be coming up. Go to dwtdhickson.com to find all the latest recipes and find some recordings. Uh, we'll put this um, talk up in the next uh, week or so so that you can refer back to it. I just want to thank Dr. Shepard again for his time. And uh, why don't we bow our heads for prayer as we close. Dear God, we're just thankful for your blessings to us. We're thankful for the gift of health. I ask that you will help us to, um, to guard that gift and to use it for uh, your honor and glory and um, to um, praise you and glorify you in everything that we do. Uh, guide us as we make choices as far as our activity, our food choices, our interactions with others getting enough sunshine, being out in nature, taking advantage of all of these uh, healing influences that you have put in our way. Uh, bless Dr. Shepard as he continues to take care of patients and give him the right words to say so that um, he can uh, motivate and uh, inspire those that he comes in contact with to change their health, their health for the better. Praise things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Well, uh, God bless all of you, and I hope to see some of you coming out at some point to uh, check out the building. That's 4605 Redlands Drive. For those of you who aren't familiar with our uh, church building, that's not. Uh, I don't know. If, can you hear Chris talking there? No. Oh, all right.
where were you, Chris, when you were up on the uh, up on the top there? No, I was at about mile 60 on a backpacking trip in the Rockies. Uh, I was near Arapaho Pass up in the uh, the Rocky Rocky Mountains, probably right there. I'm around 12,500 feet, somewhere in that range. Wow. And uh, it's just beautiful up there. You'd all enjoy it. Um, so is that where we're backpacking? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A little too far of a drive and a little too rugged for most. So, yeah. but, but anybody that has an interest, let me know. We'll, we'll set up a time. Huh. I'm, yeah. I'm going to check out. Thank all you, right. Dr. Shepard. Thank you. you. all have a great, uh, great rest of your evening. And uh, thank you all for joining us and God bless. We'll see you next, um, next third Monday of the, uh, of the month. So right. whatever that date is, I guess I should just know off the top of my head. But for the month of October, that is going to be the 18th. the 18th of October. Excellent. God bless, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, very, Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.